Dobrý deň, začíname. E, dnes ja budem hovoriť len po slovensky i môžete čítať po anglicky, dobre? No, actually the opposite. I'll speak only in English, but you can read in Slovak, OK? Kto, kto môže čítať po slovensku? No, OK. Because I spent a long, lot of time making the subtitles, so I hope you, they'll be useful. OK, so uh, this is actually a very difficult question to answer, even in the case when you speak less than a dozen languages or whether you speak a few dozen. So I'm going to start off with an example here. We have uh, polyglot A and polyglot B. And uh, both of them speak these, this number of languages at least at intermediate level, or, and uh, all of them. And they have higher active, they, and they have higher uh, passive ability, listening comprehension and such. Good pronunciation, prosody, and, and accents. And they can read all the languages. This comes, this is very important in the case of some languages. Okay, so one speaks 22 languages, the other 32. So what do these numbers mean in the following terms? Okay, overall or total difficulty of learning this set of languages. The total lexical, phonetic, and grammatical knowledge acquired in the process. The degree to which the language they've acquired help learn uh, other languages. Okay, so first of all, we have to know what languages they speak to answer these questions. All right, here we go. Now, you're going to see this uh, quite a few times, so I'll just jump right into it. So the first issues you might think would be, hmm, language versus dialect, and lexical and grammatical similarities. Okay, so what's a dialect? What's a language? There's one answer. A language is a dialect with an army and a navy. So fundamental notions such as language and dialect are primarily social. They're not linguistic constructs. They depend on society in very crucial ways. Now, linguists do, do make a distinction between language and dialect based on the concept of mutual intelligibility. So when, when there are two languages where speakers can understand each other, uh, they are considered dialects of the same language, but which language, right? Um, where they cannot understand each other, they're considered different languages. Okay, one problem with this concept, understanding, is what does understand mean? That's a very hard uh, criterion to define. And how do you, uh, it hasn't been operationalized yet, how do you do it? Okay, well, we have the dialect continuum, where speakers of A and B can speak together, and speakers of B and C can speak together, but A and C cannot. Okay? So this is very common uh, in, 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 so to, to a certain extent in, in um, Slavic language, but certainly in Bantu languages in Africa. All right, now, <laughs> Czech and Slovak, they're often considered different languages but they can understand each other for the most part, right? Now, Serbian, Croatian now became two different languages, but when I first started, uh, Slovene was my first Slavic language, but I didn't learn that much. I switched to Serbsko-Hrvatsky, uh, Serbo-Croatian. This was, uh, I'm an old folk, so this is uh, in the 70s, uh, time of Tito. So as you see, it was political, okay? And uh, the book, so I have books uh, to learn Serbo-Croatian. Have you ever seen a book to teach you Czech-Slovakian? Yes, there are. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. All right. Now, so now you have Bosnian, Serbian, Croatian, Montenegrin, maybe others if you wish. And uh, so you, you have to write it in three, la three languages here, right? <laughs> Okay, and uh, so like in Bosnia, children go to school, same place, different classroom if they speak a different language. But the teachers of the, 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 the different languages uh, represented there, they don't need an interpreter when they have a meeting, they understand each other. Okay, so 
When we're looking at a list of languages spoken by a polyglot, it's important to consider the degree of mutual intelligibility. And that way we can judge the overall difficulty of the set in terms of acquisition. So, if there are two people who speak, both speak ten languages, that's quite ambiguous. That leads us to language difficulty. So you could say, you could say which is harder, Polish or Spanish? Some people, oh yeah, it's objective, it's not subjective, Polish is harder. Look at all the Konsulski, Tono, Teshis, Bazo, Trudno Movis po Polsko, Bo, Vimova, yes, Taka. The pronunciation is more difficult, on and on and on and on. But it's easier for a Slovak learner, monolingual, to learn Polish than to learn Portuguese, right? Uh, and it's, or uh, the word I use here, Portuguese, yeah. Likewise, it's easier for uh, Spanish. It's easier for a Portuguese speaker to learn Spanish than for a Slovak speaker. So it's obviously subjective. It depends on the languages you already know. All right? So there's reasons for this. It's uh, closest in vocabulary, grammar, and very importantly, cultural background. Okay, so language difficulty. In discussing the difficulty of a given language, there's always going to be very subjective factors. And the difficulty can depend greatly on the languages that one knows. This, this type of discussion always comes up in Facebook in the polyglot uh, section, yeah? Okay. Now, uh, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this, yeah? The Defense Language Institute in California, they uh, have different time frames for each language. So you would think the ones, you know, like 64-week uh, ones are much harder, right? But that's basically, they're thinking in terms of a monolingual English speaker. Okay, so for polyglots, it's a very different situation. It depends on your total language repertoire. For example, a native speaker of English who knows Japanese at a high level can learn Korean much easier than a monolingual English speaker. Okay? So it's not just what is your native language, but what languages do you know and how well do you know them? Okay, so let's divide the question into four areas. All right, lexicon, phonetic system, grammar, and the writing system. We, even if we put in four categories, we still have a big issue with subjectivity. Okay, let's start with lexicon. So, obviously, learning languages that have uh, many cognates with languages you already know greatly facilitates uh, passive recognition and acquisition. I mean, I can give you an example. The first time I heard Slovak, I understood it. I talked to Slovaks. I used a mix between Serbian, Croatian, Polish mainly. Russian didn't help much. But I knew, I, and I immediately recognized, for example, how they, how they do the past tense. Oh, okay, that's like, it's not like Polish, it's like Croatian. Yeah, bolsom, videosom. Okay, so, uh, obviously, uh, this, the reason I could, and oh, the very bottom there, if you didn't read that, you can see just this is sentence, even in these four languages, how close it is, right? What, what, is, what are cognates? Okay, now, um, I won't leave this up a long time. You can go check it out. Perhaps you've looked at it before. There are various uh, sites where you can get data on lexical similarity. And, uh, okay, so a lexical similarity of one is 100%, it's the same language. And zero means no common words. Now, this is from Ethnolog, and the way they calculate is they compare a standard set of word lists and counting those forms that show similarity in both form and meaning. All right, but there are variations due to differing, differing word lists. So, for example, lexical similarity between French and English is considerable in lexical fields relating to culture, whereas their similarity is smaller as far as basic function words, everyday words, are concerned. Another study estimates that the number of English words directly inherited from French at 41% and 15% of other English words derived from Latin, 
putting English French lexical similarity around uh, 56%. Okay, you can also go look at charts like this, it's quite interesting. Um, now, I find the Slavic group the most interesting because uh, there's so much interesting lexical similarity as you go from east to west and north to south. Okay, so I started off south, Serbian, Croatian, went north. I studied uh, Slavic literature in Poland at university uh, 36 years ago and masters in it. And uh, mainly I read in Russian, uh, Polish and Croatian. So I see, you know, uh, first time I, I bought a course in Ukrainian. I said, oh, this is boring. I went to the last lesson, I listened to it. Oh, what was that word? You know, it, 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 I could understand most of it without really ever spending much time studying it. Okay. So, now this is important. Note that people do not have equal ability to understand cognates in other languages. Okay, it's, it's a, this, a skill that you develop to higher levels as you learn more and more diverse languages. You start to recognize them. Okay, now I want to take a closer look at comparing uh, hyperglot A and hyperglot B. Okay, so, because hyperglot A has 10 more languages. And then I gave hyperglot B uh, 22, but strategically, it has a lot of languages which will help acquire the other ones, and that's what I'm talking about here. Okay, 18 of A's languages are Slavic, only four in the case of B, but look at the four that, it, that B has. Russian, Polish, Croatian, Bulgarian. I throw Bulgarian in there because that's the oddball with the case, no case system, etc. Okay, so um, what, as you see it turn blue here, these are the languages that uh, polyglot B is acquiring. Polyglot B says, okay, I'm going to learn all these Slavic languages that polyglot A has. All right. This is a numbers game. They're in competition. Let me say I'm not into the numbers game. I love languages. I study languages because I want to use them to get to know different cultures, etc. Um, but I often see this question come out about numbers. All right. So Polyglot B decides that it's going to increase, uh, or she is going to increase his her numbers. Okay. So um, and I point out in the I don't want to read it all, okay, it takes too long, there's a lot of slides to go through, okay, but you can see, for example, with Croatian, you understand basically pretty well what's the other languages in the former Yugoslavia, and then Turkish will actually help with Bulgarian and Serbian. Serbian has a lot of words that are uh, similar to Turkish words. Uh, there, it takes some skill to notice them, because usually the vowel, there's some vowel changes and such, okay. All right, then go to the Romance languages. So uh, Polyglot B, you know, has Spanish, French, and uh, Romanian. Uh, I felt Romanian is important because that's one of the furthest away from, you know, the, uh, the um, fellow uh, Romance languages heading west. Okay, so you can see that now is picking up Portuguese and Galician and Catalan and Italian. Okay, and, and then going to Germanic, Polyglot B has English, German, Norwegian. All right, so uh, Dutch, Afrikaans, Danish, Swedish start to become easier. And uh, then uh, now that uh, Polyglot B has just finished uh, in increasing his number, increased pa passive, pa at least passive understanding in all these new Slavic, Romance, and Germanic languages. HB is looking for new challenges. So all the languages I'm going to talk about now are not on, on Polyglot A's list. Okay? So Polyglot A had 32, Polyglot B has 22, and these are those languages, uh, and, but all these other languages Polyglot A does not have. Okay, so um, HB can use knowledge of Chinese, Mandarin, and Japanese to learn Cantonese, and then Vietnamese and Korean. 
Okay, this is from uh, another pre presentation I did in Berlin a couple years ago, showing the vocabulary uh, of Chinese, Vietnamese, Japanese, and Koreans, showing synthetic examples. So it's hard to pick a number. I would say that uh, Vietnamese, Japanese, and Korean generally have maybe 50 to 60 percent of the vocabulary coming from Chinese. Of course, that's a long discussion, you know, when they mean different things and combinations, on and on and on. But here are some examples where you can see uh, the words are quite similar. Um, if you know how the characters uh, change phonetically, like from, it's better if you're coming from Cantonese than from Mandarin. But like uh, from, from Mandarin, J changes to K, and uh, for Jehun, Keron, Kekon, Kekon. Kekon Hada, Kekon Suru. Okay. All right. But when Poi got uh, B is going into uh, Vietnamese and Korean, uh, Poi got B discovers that, okay, first of all, they are not mutually intelligible without study. Okay, I, I teach in Japan, I teach management um, at a Japanese university, the uh, language of instruction is Japanese, but in my seminars, the foreign students uh, mainly come to my seminars, uh, I have uh, four seminars totaling about uh, 80 or 90 students, I only have five Japanese students, but I have uh, Thai, Chinese, uh, Myanmar, uh, Nepali, uh, Tamang, uh, Sri Lankan, um, uh, Vietnamese, on and on and on. So, um, in my seminars, when I'm teaching, sometimes I make jokes in various languages to force the students to ask the other students what I just said. I'll get the Chinese students to say to laugh, and then I'll say something in Vietnamese or Nepali, and they're all going back and forth. I want to create some interest among them. So I, I never tell them what the meaning is. They're going to have to find out from the other students. OK, so anyway, um, it, this just, you probably had time to read it now. It just shows where there's similarities and differences. All right, now let's move on to uh, some other languages that uh, uh, Polyglot B has. So with with Thai, uh, Paul B is very good in Thai, can already communicate uh, in Lao, Isan. And let's say that Paul B wants to expand uh, his or her understanding of uh, other uh, related languages like Shan, Thai. And um, then the lower part, uh, Polygot uh, B speaks Indonesian, but regularly watches movies in Malay, so starting to get better in, in Malay. Um, Polygot B speaks Hindi, so wants to learn the Pali because Polygot B uh, loves the Himalayas. Okay, there's some self-biography in here, but it's the opposite with me. My Nepali is better than my Hindi. Um, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> also for trekking the Himalayas using Tibetan, to learn uh, Sherpa in Tamang. Um, now, if we we're talking about greatly increasing numbers, uh, which groups would you focus on? Definitely Slavic, but also Tibetan related. You can get around 30 languages from there. It depends what you call language or dialect, but if you use mutual intelligibility, definitely 30 or 40 languages. Tamangs don't understand Sherpas. When I was trekking just in February in the Solokumba area, I was speaking Sherpa, there was a Tamang, and he's you know, going like this, I, and I told him in Tamang. They didn't understand, there's some words they, they generally understand, but uh, the, the, the origins from Tibetan, so you see how things change and the grammar is similar. Okay, so Polyglot B speaks Tamil, um, so loves southern India, so can now speak uh, um, Malayalam, because I get that wrong a lot. <laughs> Malayalam. Malayam. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't speak uh, Tamil. Uh, but we speak, B speaks Turkish and uh, now wants to travel around Central Asia, which I did, by the way, uh, going in the former Soviet Union in 1981. So I went to all these places that you see listed here. And um, I didn't speak Turkish, I just spoke Russian to everybody. But now if I went, I'd learn Turkish first, okay? Uh, uh, and then try to learn some of these other languages listed here. 
Okay, so probably got been as Farsi, so yeah, I can speak to Afghanis who speak Dari, and of course, uh, Tajikis are basically speaking a certain form of Farsi, that means 1220. Right, thank you. Um, okay, and then let's go to the Bantu languages. So, has Swahili and Zulu. So, that's one of the biggest uh, group to get a lot of languages from, okay? Because uh, you can start from the north and go south. Like you, if you you could you could add if you had Swana, uh, then Mosa and have to drink Mosa. <laughs> if you saw a Hadrian, you'd know what I mean. Okay, the lad. I can't get my clicks out. Okay. Um, now, let's go to the next uh, issue, which is uh, pronunciation, the phonetic system. All right, so first of all, we have to think in terms of the phoneme. It's a distinct unit um, of sound which <clears throat> creates a different meaning. Okay, so uh, a well-known example is in Japanese. Uh, there's L and R. Uh, sometimes it's more like an L, sometimes it's an R. It doesn't matter. It's the same word. I have a, if I have a student, I have a student named... Luna, Runa. And you say Luna if you know that she was be named after that, or you can say Runa, Runa, Luna. Doesn't matter. But Reich Leis definitely is a problem. Okay, so now, in order, in order to understand various uh, variations in accents and pronunciation amongst our fellow speakers, in our mind we have neural mappings and that subsume all related sounds that are not important in determining meanings, okay? In other words, they are not phonemes. So gaining the ability to distinguish and produce sounds in new target language that uh, do not have distinct equivalents in, one, in one's language is required, okay? So it's increasing your, your phonetic uh, repertoire. Now, there are such things called brain traps. For example, a uh, violinist playing a vi violin all the time like this will get uh, what they'll get the, the two fingers will start to stick together when you try to move one you move both at the same time okay so this happens when you don't differentiate in the movements and it's the same with uh, how your the sounds that you hear okay you they're not differentiated because uh, the, me the difference between these two sounds is not important in terms of meaning. Okay, so as I told you, the R and the L. So every time you don't distinguish between the two, it's reinforced. All right, so since the basis of the problem is the absence of differentiation in the auditory cortex, you have to practice with exaggerated differences. Okay, so the speech therapist, when I was five years old, six years old, I went to a speech therapist and um, the language I have the most trouble with, or the only language I have trouble with speaking clearly is English, my native language, because I have this kind of psychological barrier there. But I try hard, okay? I try hard not to mumble, I try to enunciate, sometimes it's exaggerated, because I was taught like this, ah, apple, okay? So, uh, he concluded that it's possible to teach anyone to speak a second language without a foreign accent with proper training. Okay, so you restructure your brain when you learn a total language. This is quite interesting study um, that they looked at China, native Chinese speakers and uh, Europeans who learn Chinese and those who don't speak Chinese. And uh, the results identified two brain regions, first in the vicinity of the right anterior temporal lobe and the left insula, where speakers of Chinese had significantly, gray, uh, significantly greater gray and white matter density compared to those who didn't speak Chinese. Now, importantly, these effects were found both in native speakers and the Euro European subjects who learned Chinese. Okay, so it develops. So I wasn't born that way. It's not ethnic. It's not... You don't have to do it as a child before you're two years old or five years old or 10 years old or 20 years old or 30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old. You can do it in your 60s or 70s or 80s. It'll still happen. Not as easy at times, but it'll still happen. You have to put more effort. That's a long discussion. Okay, so uh, phonetic difficulty is defined on the basis greatly depending on the diversity of languages that you already know. 
Okay? So uh, acquiring ability in multiple diverse languages increases your uh, repertoire of uh, sounds. So you could argue that languages with greater phoneme vi variety, consonants, vowels, diphthongs, triphthongs, are more difficult in terms of pronunciation. But it's very hard to find how many there are in a language. For example, in English, uh, I've seen a textbook which, in Japanese which shows 26, 26 vowel sounds in English. And then some people say, no, there's 24, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And then, yeah, we can argue about, people can argue about how correct this is, but here's just some examples, the total number of phonemes, including diphthongs in some uh, languages in Europe. Here are some non-European languages. Notice Japanese at 24. Japanese extremely small uh, phonetic system. Okay, so now we also have to consider tonemes and chronemes. Okay, so toneme is tones. And uh, my subjective view is that highly tonal language that I speak, amongst them, uh, I would say the order of difficulty for me is Vietnamese, Thai, Lao, and Chinese. Um, I would put Cantonese at the top, but when I speak Cantonese, my tones aren't very good. So how could I, you know? So it's more difficult, but I'm not very fluent in Cantonese. Okay, what about grammar? As in other languages, difficult is very subjective. It depends on your experience. Okay, so I think it's a mistake to assume that uh, languages that have a lot of inflections, like Slavic languages, Latin, etc., are inherently more difficult than those that don't have any. Okay? A well-known assumption is that all human languages are, are overall equally complex. And they give this in encyclopedias and linguistic courses. Still people debate it. Uh, <clears throat> apparently, complexity differences, is, differences in certain areas where were explained with a balancing force that simplicity in one area uh, would be balanced with complexity in another area. Okay, so case marking tends to correlate with uh, flexible word order. And Indo-European languages have lost a lot of their, uh, much of the case markings, like especially English, and have developed a, a more rigid uh, word order here, English versus Latin. So con concerning uh, total grammatical complexibility, uh, Hogan said, objective measurement is difficult, but impressionalistically it would, be, it would seem that the total grammatical complexity of any language, counting both morphology and syntax, uh, is about the same for as any other because they had the same job to do. What you don't do syntactically, you have to do morphologically. Okay, so, you know, this is just an example of Chinese that doesn't have any inflections, but the word order uh, becomes uh, quite important as well as uh, the aspects in Chinese, you know, in order to express uh, um, past tense, future, etc. Okay, completeness, non-complete, on and on. Um, Indo Indonesian verbs also do not have tense, um, but they have a lot of prefixes, suffixes, and cofixes. Now, confix, I hear all these people all the time say, oh, Indonesian Malay, very easy. Well, it's because you speak simple Indonesian Malay. That's all. You, you, if you hit a higher level, you're going to realize the complexity. All right, now, writing system. So there's one fairly objective statement for this category, that Japanese and Chinese are the most difficult languages. Now, I argue Japanese is more difficult than, than Chinese. I say Chinese literature in Japanese, okay? So I was dealing, learning both languages at the same time uh, from 1981, okay, from 36 years ago. And because there's many more pronunciations of characters in, in, in Japanese, more variation. Um, now, what's after that? Okay, this is, I'm going to say it's Tibetan. Watch this video if you haven't seen it. It's very interesting. I would say Tibetan is uh, after, okay, Japanese, Chinese, first and second, then Tibetan. You might come up with different other examples, but first learn about Tibetan. Okay, English is a crazy one. I would say it's one of the most difficult uh, amongst uh, Indo-European languages to, to write, all right, because that's fish. Not the one on top there. Okay, Spanish is 
phonetic language, so yeah, it's written how it's pronounced. Slovak is too, very much so, but you have to learn a few things about soft uh, uh, consonants and such. Okay, so I'll move on to what is fluency. Um, where am I in time? So what is fluency? So fluency is a flow of speech. Uh, fluent speech is smooth, forward-moving, unhesitant, effortless speech. A disfluency is any break in fluent speech, like stuttering. Okay? So people are, are you fluent? Some monolinguals, monolingual native speakers are not fluent in the only language they know. Just, just look up at this speech. Just, just look at this speech uh, given by Trump. I mean, speech, he was talking. Never really gives a speech. Um, it's just all over the place, okay? So that's just mental deficiencies, you know. Um, <clears throat> also, also uh, I, I seem to be going a lot quicker than I thought it would. So, well, that means I can expand. I would have done, gone slower and such and explain more. But about fluency in a language, again, I, I, when somebody says, are you fluent? I always want to say, you know, okay, look, I've been a professor lecturing for 28 years, so I always want to explain in detail. All right, so I always want to say, well, hold on, what do you mean by fluency? Oh, well, are you fluent? Well, yeah, I mean, in certain languages, I can say these 800 words and these phrases and sound like a native, so am I fluent? Yeah, when I'm speaking, I'm speaking fluently. No, 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 I mean, can you talk about uh, this and that and uh, well, I say, okay, in your native language or any language you know, can you talk about astrophysics? Are you fluent in economics? Okay. So, ah, the next question is, so what about vocabulary? So a common question is, how much vocabulary do you need to become fluent in a language? Well, there's, yeah, again, what domain are you going to be speaking about? Right? Uh, fluency is always domain-specific. So you need to know the necessary related vocabulary. For example, there are many subjects like neurosurgery, cognitive linguistics, quantum physics, which many people cannot talk about. They don't have the related vocabulary or knowledge. So it's quite possible to speak very fluently about a surprising number of everyday subjects, domains with a vocabulary ranging from 1,000 to 2,000 words. You, believe me. You know, people argue, yeah, I mean, we'll probably get into this discussion. They say, oh, you need to know 20,000 words, 30,000 words, and you're, you know, a certain level. But wait a second. If you run into somebody who has very good pronunciation, very good prosody, to such an extent that you don't know they're not a native speaker when they first start talking to you, okay? They can talk about many things with a vocabulary of 2,000 words. They, especially when you, like you all, as polyglots know, when you're speaking a language which you're not so great in, but doing pretty well, you try to control the conversation so that you don't get into a subject where you have to use a vocabulary you don't know. And let's, or you try to get them to give you the vocabulary, and then you, you, know, you forget what it is. Okay? So sometimes when you get beyond, well, it can happen when you're only three or four or five or six languages, but when you get beyond two dozen languages or so, and you're switching between them, there are languages for me, including my native language, I forget the words. But then I hear it and everything comes back and everything related to that word comes back and then I can say it, okay? A good example for me was when I, uh, after studying Slavic literature in Poland, I went to Japan and uh, I was in Japan and I was watching uh, a movie with a friend and it was a Polish movie. And uh, so I, after I, I turned to her and started speaking Polish. And, and and then, oh, oh, I'm speaking Polish, I had to speak Japanese. I couldn't think of any Japanese. Nothing. I looked at the table. Deburu, no, that didn't help. TV, tell me, oh, no, that didn't help. And finally, she said, hmm? finally she said something, and oh, okay, and then everything came out, you know? Okay, so sometimes, so generally, depending on our emotional, our general knowledge of the language, our emotional and psychological state, uh, you know, sometimes it just doesn't come. We can't speak fluently. We need to, you know, uh, 
get somebody to bring that back to us. But again, the argument uh, I think holds that you can say quite a lot with 1,200. I'll expand on this. I saw this. Does anybody know this blog? I wrote to the person and said, who are you? Because I want to give you credit. Do you know it, Thingaholic? Nobody knows? Okay. Didn't answer back. Because this is not my, uh, this is what I found. It says, although an average adult native speaker has an active vocabulary of about 20,000 words, not Trump, uh, the reading teacher's, uh, reading teacher's book of lists claims that the first 25 words are used in 33% of everyday writing. First 100 words in 50%. First 1,000 words in 89% of everyday writing. Okay. So it's been said that vocabulary, that a vocabulary of just 3,000 words provides coverage for about 95% of common texts, such as news items, blogs, etc. And um, the rough amount of words necessary before we can efficiently learn from context with unsimplified text, okay? So you just build on from there. You have the context, you get, you get to Increase your vocabulary just through usage, just through passive uh, usage. Okay, so maybe we shouldn't say fluency. We'll say language proficiency. Um, okay, I'm going to the next subject here, but I'll just comment. Of course, there, like we have here, native CBA, right? Okay, so mm, for me, I've seen people who have a C something one exam and they're not very fluent. Their prosody, you know, there's some, there's some issues with these tests. You can study for a test, okay? So, um, but it gives us a general idea. So it's kind of hard to measure. I'll put that aside. I just want to go to another thing that people always uh, have an issue with is, uh, do you speak like a native? Are you a native speaker? Okay. There's no single viable model of a native speaker. Monolinguals greatly vary in their ability, their vocabulary, their pronunciation, their adherence to standard grammar, eloquence, social pragmatics, etc. And a non-native speaker can potentially surpass many native speakers in various domains of target language. So didn't somebody say that now the French, is he president or premier? President? speaks better English than the U.S. president, right? Okay, surpassed. I don't, that's not such a great achievement, but that's very good, yeah. Okay, so now I get to the last side. I guess I, I did it pretty quickly. So if you ask me how many languages do I speak, here's my answer, okay? So it's complicated. Oh, what's that? Because that? It's complicated because uh, First of all, I'm going to talk about passive and, uh, passive and uh, active knowledge, which is very important, right? Because as I mentioned, the first time that I heard Slovak, I understood almost all of it. Well, that's passive. But for somebody who doesn't speak any Slavic language, that's amazing. It's like, oh, you, you're almost perfect in Slovak. You understand everything they said there. Oh, you watched that movie. You read that book. You read that sign. Okay? So passive can be very important. So what I did here... As I put in red, medium to high active knowledge and ability, and then blue, medium to high passive knowledge and ability. The, the, the darker the color, the more ability. All right. uh, green, some limited passive and active knowledge. In other words, uh, okay, I've uh, dealt with it some in the past, I haven't used it that much, uh, etc. And the, I mean, the, here are I, the plus side, I mean, for example, some that I know quite well. Uh, I didn't put in either polyglot A or polyglot B's languages. So when I, I'm making this argument from, from mostly from languages I know very well. I don't know Turkish. Uh, um, and uh, maybe there's another one. Oh, one of this I don't know well or know at all. Okay, so what's the answer? I mean, I threw all these flags. Last year I just spoke Slovak, but... Uh, you know, I only put one flag here, Slovak. It didn't help in getting people to speak Slovak with me. Um, this year I threw in a lot more and then wrote in a few. Uh, but, you know, what's the meaning? You know, people look at that. The more you have, you know, then it's like, okay, but can you speak them all fluently? Oh, wait a second, let me explain to you. 
um, yeah, this thing was like Tibetan, that's really hard, and I put in already 300 hours, and I can say da 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 and do this and this and this. Oh, uh, yeah, Slovak, I studied five weeks last year and two months this year, and I wrote these subtitles. And I had some, well, using Google Translate, and I knew what was wrong, and then I, my Slovak uh, partner online, Checking for you, but I, under, I, could, I could understand this lecture in Slovak if somebody else was doing it. Is that 40? Okay. All right, let's open it to questions. Thank you. Um, okay, if you had to choose just five languages that would let you understand as many languages, not people as possible, which would you choose? Well, I think you'll get the idea from what I listed here, as many as possible. I'd probably, I'd pick one Bantu language, one Slavic language. I would pick Slovak for Slavic language, Slovak or, yeah, Slovak. Yeah, it's right in the middle. Um, oh, yeah, question? Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I might pick like Spanish, Portuguese, um, Chinese, um, and then go from there. Um, many of us hate to be asked how many languages can you speak, yet we often ask other people the same. <laughs> yeah, that's because we're, we're generally curious how to avoid it. No, I ask people the same, but, well, no, I don't ask that necessarily. Um, I, kinda, I might ask you to speak this language here, uh, just so we can, you know, change languages or something. Um, when a non-linguist asks you this question, how would you reply to them in an easily understandable yet accurate way? Wh who wrote this? What's the question? Yeah, what's the question, though? Oh, this question. I'm sorry. What's the question? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, how many languages do you speak? I, would, I, I think it's something concise. Well, it depends. I would say it depends Are you talking about active knowledge, like... Uh, speaking and writing, or are you talking about passive knowledge, such as reading and listening comprehension is what I might throw out there at first. If you have, a, you know, uh, quite a few languages there. Yeah. And then you could say, okay, well, maybe it's a dozen when it's just, you know, generally understanding just what's being said, and well, okay, maybe it's five or six, you know, when I have to say the same thing. Um, are you putting your slides online? I, I put them up in that cloud. I don't know how it works. Who asked this question? Um, I mean, you're welcome to have them if you're interested. Uh, I'll, let's talk about it afterwards. Are there m more such lists of languages by difficulty? The famous? I don't know. I only know the Foreign Service one, you know, uh, as a list of language difficulty. Um, how do you personally learn vocabulary, vocabulary into a low, medium ability? in a low to medium ability language? I don't know exactly what you mean by the question. Who asked it? Yeah, what do you, what do you mean? Well, so every language is going to be different, right? So um, if to build my Slovak vocabulary, I, I, I watched uh, uh, TV online you know, some series, I read things in Slovak, because I had enough knowledge of co cognate languages to build it that way, and I just look up words which I couldn't recognize. So if it's a totally new language, uh, which not related to any language I know, so let's say I'm learning Turkish or something like that, but then I might know things from Serbian, so who knows. Um, now, I don't, I don't have a particular method, uh, per se, it's different every time, you know, depends on the language. Um, where is uh, for us in Germanic language? In the Germanic, oh, in the Germanic language. You mean in the in the slide there with the who who asked? Um, how do you pronounce? It? Is it feroce? feroce? Well, what is it? Forest. Where is it in that slide? In the picture I showed? Oh yeah, but see, I I didn't. The language I chose for them was strategic to show. Give give a lot of languages to Polygot A, ten more, but actually with a much. Does everybody agree that Polygot A has, first of all, acquired a much 
lower amount of grammatical characteristics and vocabulary, et cetera, lexical, right? Okay? So that was strategic choice of choosing the language was that I, that I know that if B has these languages, B can learn the other languages of polyglot A, plus many, many more that would be very challenging because polyglot A, because polyglot A has never, you know, dealt with that. Um, okay, in my experience, in my experience, Mandarin speakers tend to be better at approximating Japanese pitch than Vietnamese speakers, even though both are tonal. Are there any reasons for that? Yeah, it's a different system, you know. Hashi, hashi, hashi. Well, there's, but they, it depends on the dialect, okay? The pitch, the pitch is dialect dependent. Okay, Japanese is not a tonal language, for those who are not familiar with Japanese, but it has pitch, okay? And then where you hit the pitch, changes the meaning of words in some cases. It's not that important. And again, I say it depends on which dialect of Japanese you speak. Um, and whether Mandarin... I don't know. Okay, I can tell you because I'm t I teach a lot of Asian students, okay, as I said in my seminars. Who do you think among my students learn Japanese the fastest and to the highest level? Korean. But what kind of Koreans? From where? Koreans from northern China. Okay, they grow up Korean as a mother tongue, learn Chinese in school, Japanese is a cinch. Okay? Yeah, they have all that vocabulary. The pronunciation of vocabulary is often closer to Korean and Japanese, like jikan, shikan, okay, keikon, uh, keirong, jumbi, jumbi. It's closer than the, than the Chinese. Also, they, they know more characters. Koreans from Korea don't, young people don't know a lot of characters, so they struggle. Um, I just lost it. Okay. Uh, any, any other question? Yeah? What's that? First of all, congratulations, because uh, you are one of my favorite polyglot speakers, and I, <laughs> I always uh, learn a lot of things in your talks. And I cite also you uh, very often in my, in my, in my talks. Uh, I have an, one comment and one question. The comment is, the comment is um, you might be interested in uh, a mathematical approach that I have published uh, some years ago to calculate uh, with a matrix of phonemes and graphemes uh, the degree of so the percentage of bijectivity uh, and so the easiness of language uh, of learning the phonetic of a language and and then the question yeah yeah, well, that's yeah and no this is, was just a comment uh, uh, because you talked about that. And the question is, uh, broadening the field from phonetics to the whole language learning. Uh, do you really agree with the fact that all languages are equal, dif equally difficult? Because there are some studies that show that uh, for Esperanto, for example, that is uh, like 10, 10 times easier in terms of number of hours. Okay. Um, it's, I, I, I don't think all languages are, uh, have the same amount of difficulty. How should I say it? Um, it's, but it's very subjective. It depends on what you know. And also, it's not just your knowledge of other languages. Do, why are you learning the language? Okay, I think if, if there's somebody, another person, okay, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever the case, you know, if, yeah, if there's something that draws you to the language, and it becomes a lot easier, right? Even if it's more complex, okay? If you identify with the culture, there's something that you really like about it, and you want to act like that, and you, you start to walk like they do, and for example, in Japan, we have many foreign students, so if I can tell the Japanese and the Chinese just by the way that they move their body, you know, around the campus, the way they act, you know? So if you really, have an affinity towards the way people present themselves and exist, and then it's much easier. Okay? Yeah, but I mean, I'm I'm trying to make I'm trying to make the answer uh, very subjective because that's where it's at. We can talk about the objectivity now. Do I believe all languages are equally complex? 
Yes, maybe to a certain extent. You could argue that some languages, uh, let's say English, for example, has been used by many people, not just native speakers, to explore many different uh, domains, ideas, etc. So therefore, it has a lot of complex concepts and ideas and create the vocabulary and on and on and on and on. Grammatical complexity, um, uh, do, you, do you think a Slavic language is more grammatically complex than Malay or, or, or Chinese? No, I don't either. This is different. You know, some people look at Chinese and they say, oh yeah, you know, this looks simple. All right, but you know, like they, they'll say, uh, washou zhong wen hen hao. You can't say, washou zhong wen shou de hen hao. You have to show the, you have to repeat, okay? It's a rule in Chinese. What is the rule? What is it called? It doesn't have a name. Japanese grammar, when you read it in a book written in English, is totally different. My wife is a Japanese, uh, certified Japanese teacher, and the books that they use to teach Japanese to Japanese, it's totally different concepts of grammar. Okay? They don't call them the same things. I do think there is uh, some dif uh, difference in difficulty that we can make out though. Um, on the vocabulary level, certainly if a language is uh, a mixture like modern Greek uh, as composed to a more pure descent or English as op opposed to French. Uh, and on the grammatical level, by comparing languages in the same group, like some Slavic uh, languages have more cases that others have dropped or ad assimilated. Uh, Spanish has more irregular verbs uh, than uh, Italian. So on that level, there is certainly some uh, difference in difficulty. That's if you think regularity is more diff is easier than irregularity. I mean, yesterday I was in the panel and the person sitting next to me had the same feeling. We were talking about Esperanto, right? And they kept arguing, Esperanto, look how regular you build it up like this. And we both said, we love irregularities. <laughs> I remember it easy. Yeah, because it's irregular. By the way, now it's it's, it's twelve fifty. I I will stay. It's lunchtime coming up. If you want to leave, go right ahead. If you have, I'll stay for more questions if you have them. Okay. Anybody have a question? <laughs> <laughs>